Good afternoon. My name is Don Sefcik. I have the pleasure of serving as the Senior Associate Dean of the College of Osteopathic Medicine here at Michigan State University. And we've convened together this evening for the ninth annual Slavery to Freedom and American Odyssey Visiting Faculty Lecture Series. Please rest assured that although this is the final lecture of this series, we already have plans well underway for our 2010 program, uh, so this will continue. Thank you to our many MSU college and unit sponsors and corporate sponsors for supporting this activity and allowing it to happen. All sponsors are listed on the poster. Please take a moment to read and, if possible, acknowledge any of the college and units for their support. The entire series is being video recorded and will be placed in the MSU library, 
the MSU Multicultural Center, and the Lansing Main Library. In addition, the series is being webcast live by MSU Broadcasting Services and will be archived at http msu. Dot, I'm sorry, wmsu.org. Parking um, validations are available out front to get out of the parking ramp, so please make sure you grab one on the way out of the auditorium this evening. And if you just take a moment to assure that your pagers and your cell phones are turned into an off or a vibrating position, we would appreciate that. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. William G. Anderson, who along with his wife, Norma, Martin Luther King Jr., Ralph Abernathy, and others were the foci of the Albany Movement, one of the most important civil rights struggles in the United States. One of the first African-American osteopathic physicians in the South, Dr. Anderson ultimately became a surgeon in the Detroit area and subsequently rose to assume the national presidency of the American Osteopathic Association. A clinical professor at MSU-COM for more than three decades, Dr. Anderson currently serves as the Vice President for Academic Affairs and is the Osteopathic Medical Education Director at the Detroit Medical Center. He also serves as a Senior Advisor to the Dean of the College of Osteopathic Medicine. Dr. Anderson. And inasmuch as Dean Strample is not here, I will be the one to remind you to turn those things off. Uh, as he says, put them on stun. So when you all of a sudden jump up, I'll know that you have been stunned, and it's time for you to answer whoever that is calling. Let me again thank you for coming, and let me express my appreciation to, I will call them my staff. Actually, uh, they are my bosses who really make this program work. Barbara Breedlove, she's somewhere. Barbara, if you're here, raise your hand so we'll know who you are. And Kim Camp, who is also outside, one of those who helps this program to be the success it has been over the past nine years. And uh, Sandy Kilborn, who is away this week, the first time she's missed one, I believe, in the nine years that we've been doing this. And, of course, you heard that Dean Strample happens to be away also. But those are the people that make me look good. I've often told them, I don't need any help looking to be made to look stupid. I can do that by myself. I need you people to help make me look good, and they have done just that. It has been, ex it has been my pleasure to be the one who has helped coordinate this program over the past nine years, and we will be continuing into next year, which will be the 10th year. And uh, you may or may not have been here last week. If you were not here, you did not hear me say, we have invited uh, Jeremiah Wright for next year, and we also have invited uh, the author of the trilogy of the Martin Luther King years, Taylor Branch, and we've also uh, had the confirmation now on Calvin Butts from the historic um, church in Harlem, New York, where Adam Clayton Powell was the pastor. And of course, the person who started the series nine years ago, it will be 10 years previously, uh, Charles G. Adams. So I look forward to having all of you here next year. Now, don't have to wait in line a whole year to get a seat. We'll see that we have adequate room to accommodate you. Now, it is my privilege to present to you uh, Dr. Cheryl Townsend, Gilks. And let me say this about Dr. Gilks. I got to know her through my pastor, Charles Gilchrist Adams. And this morning at breakfast, we found out there was another Gilchrist in the family, also from somewhere in South Carolina. So all I said then was my great-grandfather probably got around quite a bit, more than I knew. <laughs> but, uh, but because Charles Gilchrist Adams uh, and I are cousins somehow linked, uh, he was the one who introduced, uh, introduced me to Dr. Gilks. So now I've gotten to know her very well over the past couple of days. So that's why I am privileged to introduce to you and present to those who've met her previously, Dr. Cheryl Townsend Jilks. Now, right now, she hails from Waterville, Maine, where she is a Director of African American Studies at the Colby College, and she's also a Professor of African American Studies and Sociology. Now, it was brought to my attention, certainly by Reverend Adams and others, that she is the one who has written a book and it is entitled, The If It Wasn't For The Women, Black Women's Experience and Womanist Culture in Church and Community. <laughs> well, I can tell you, I can tell you, I had one of those women who I can say without fear of contradiction, had it not been for that woman, I would not be standing before you today. And I would not have had the experiences that I've had in my lifetime. 
So she has, has authored a number of articles that are widely published. And uh, she is so well known among those circles of the sociologists and the African American studies people that uh, I was surprised that we did not have her here sooner. But anyway, better late than never. So I'm indeed privileged to present to you Dr. Cheryl Townsend Jones. Dr. Jones. Good evening. First of all, let me say thank you to Dr. Anderson and his staff, especially Ms. Breedlove, who had to um, wait for the delays in my responses to emails because I seem to have what I call acquired attention deficit disorder, adult acquired attention deficit disorder brought on by the onslaught of email. I'm just not ready for the 21st century, so please bear with me. But also to the dean and to all of the uh, faculty and staff of the College of As Osteopathic Medicine, to all of you here at, at Michigan State University and members of the community, I say good evening and I thank you for this honor. I feel deeply honored to have seen the wording on the publicity that labeled me a civil rights leader. I am. I, and I believe me, growing up in Cambridge, Massachusetts um, was a little bit different than Albany, Georgia. But my first time I was on a picket line, Dr. Anderson, I was only 12 years old. So I missed a few moments of the movement in terms of participation. But I am honored that to be included in this august series of people who all of whom I admire, many of whom I know, and those whom I do not know, I wish I did. So you've been very fortunate here at Michigan State University, and I hope I do not do anything to make you feel unfortunate this evening. I am just happy, glad to be here. And then to that beautiful chorus that just sang, um, thank you because my title tonight is Yet With a Steady Beat, The Gift of an Activist Womanhood. Nearly 46 years ago, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. challenged America with a speech that was actually a sermon that has been so quoted and overused that one of King's biographers has suggested that there be a 10-year moratorium on playing that speech. I do not agree with him. Inspired by the prayer of the clergy coordinator of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, Prathia Hall, later Reverend Doctor and Professor Prathia Hall, King told America that he had a dream. That dream of equality and interracial community stretched across this continent-wide nation, east and west and north and south. In that dream, King not only named some of the nation's greatest landmarks, but he signaled by naming Lookout Mountain in Tennessee and Stone Mountain in Georgia that his dream included a vision of conversion and inclusion of the most visible and violent purveyors of racism. King then, like the good Baptist preacher that he was, to his very bones, reached back to the voices of the prophet Isaiah and John the Baptist, saying, I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places shall be made plain, and the crooked places shall be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is the faith. With this faith, we shall be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. The events of this past year 
have placed that image of hewing out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope in very bold relief. The themes of hope and change have defined our existence and topped the news as this presidential campaign gave President Barack Obama a victory and an installation in the White House that many of us never believed would have been possible in our lifetime. Last summer, when I took my parents out for their 66th wedding anniversary, my 89-year-old father said in a voice that brought me nearly to tears, daughter, when black fathers are very serious and being profound, they say, daughter, in a way that no one else can say it. And he said, daughter, I never thought I would live long enough to be able to vote for a black man for president. My mother, also 89, concurred with that melodious hum that our mothers so often use to communicate. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I cannot say what I prayed harder for, my parents' realization of their dream or Obama's victory. On election day, my 89-year-old parents drove to the polls, parked in a handicapped space, and knowing my parents the way I do, I know they argued over whose handicap permit they would use at that moment, his or hers. And then on their canes, daddy on his one point and mommy on her four point, made their way into the polls. Daddy said things sort of came to a halt when they arrived because the people at the polls knew them. My parents have voted since they've been able to vote. Took me with them when I was little. I remember being in the polling place in a snowsuit, okay? And those of you who know snowsuits know I was little, okay? They, and so they came in and the people saw them, escorted them to the head of the line, and my mother told me with a note of joy that made it sound like they had a second honeymoon. We voted in adjoining booths. We were right next to each other when we voted for Obama. My mother who attended segregated schools in Philadelphia and whose mother took hot meals to the soldiers who rode public transportation in Philadelphia to defend newly hired black motormen. My father who used Maryland's collegiate segregation statutes to wangle a scholarship to Morehouse and who fought in a segregated army during World War II and went back for Korea, with, and who has his purple heart, his bronze star, his oak leaf cluster, and his silver star, and a whole lot of other things I don't understand. You know, those patches and those bars and those, I don't understand it, but he's got a lot there. My parents, who believed in the possibilities of this nation and worked to see them happen, worked in their churches, worked in the community, worked in the schools, worked at every opportunity to be ambassadors for the dreams and the hopes of the slaves. My parents were part of the cast of millions who shed tears on election night when Barack Obama accurately labeled that night a defining moment in America's history. Change has come to America. We hear this day, we are here today at a moment of new and wonderful possibilities in America. How did the chorus say it? Stony the road we try, bitter the chastening rod felt in the days when hope unborn had died. And yet, yet, yet with a steady beat, have not our weary feet come to the place for which our fathers and mother's side, yet with a steady beat. A place two years ago we could scarcely believe to be possible, yet with a steady beat, describes an American odyssey that needs to be thickly described to be appreciated. Yet with a steady beat, the gift of an activist womanhood is my attempt to exhort and encourage you to grasp 
the thick description, the minute details of the story of slavery to freedom and American odyssey. I want you to grasp it from a woman-centered point of view. We need that woman-centered point of view. Why? Because in a world where women do the bulk of the suffering, we need to be able to see that. We need that woman-centered point of view. Why? Because women who are committed to the survival and wholeness of an entire people, male and female, need to be lifted up as models for those of us who want to move the human experience forward for all. Yes, we are on a mountaintop, but we still have a lot of work to do. Yet, with a steady beat, the gift of an activist womanhood. I have one point this evening, and that one point is that black women have been key to the organizational integrity of every effort of black people to confront oppression and to seek freedom and survival in this society. My point is summed up by part of the title of my book, If It Wasn't For The Women. One civil rights leader is reputed to have said, if the women ever leave the movement, I'm going where the women are going because nothing is going to happen without the women. <laughs> if it wasn't for the women. My point is built on the foundation of the great thinker W.E.B. Du Bois. It's for those of you who may not know, yes, it is spelled D-U-B-O-I-S. And yes, those of you who have taken French may be tempted to pronounce it as if it were spelled D-E-W-B-W-A-H. Don't do that. Alice Walker in The Color Purple has given us the proper pronunciation by spelling it D-U-B-O-Y-C-E. It's a family choice that they made. He is William Edward Burghardt Du Bois. And many of you are familiar with William Edward Burghardt Du Bois because he wrote a book called The Souls of Black Folk. But I'm building tonight on the foundation of a book he wrote 21 years later titled The Gift of Black Folk the Negro in the making of America, the gift of black folk. At the end of the souls of black folk, Du Bois asked himself a question that needed answering. Great thinkers know how to ask great questions. And in his essay titled Of the Sorrow Songs, he launched into an excursus about America's history and he said, this country how came it yours, this country? Before the pilgrims landed, we were here. And then he poetically goes on to make the argument that it is the hands and labor of black people that cut something like 200 years off the development time of this nation. And he goes on to say that black folks had brought their three gifts and mingled it with others in this nation. He was arguing against the cultural erasure that was so much a part of that time, the cultural humiliation that was standard and de rigueur for the day. And he wanted people to see black people in the making of their nation. And he talked about three gifts, labor, song, and spirit. 21 years later, that gift had become nine, those, those, that three point discussion of gifts had become nine gifts. And in that book, he talks about the role of people of African descent in the travels with the explorers. And he lifts up the, um, the, the character of Estevan, who was the first one who was black and the first to see the Pacific Ocean. He talks about the importance of black labor, and indeed that is the largest chapter in the book. He reviews the roles that black soldiers had played in all of the wars up to 1921, up to that turn of the century. And then he comes up with three chapters that are very important points he makes about American history. He argues that one gift on the part of black people is what he calls the emancipation of democracy. That the struggle for freedom throughout slavery 
was a struggle that rebounded to the benefit of the entire nation. I need not go into detail about the legal histories of slavery and the cultural history of slavery, but there are eight, and you sometimes need to sit down and read the Constitution, read the whole Constitution. When my, um, I, I, need, I need to mention this because it was hard for me during the campaign. Everybody knew I was an Obama supporter. I was a delegate to the Maine State Convention. I, I mean, I was a Obama mama big time. <laughs> Which meant I couldn't talk about the election in, in good, really in class, I, I, without sliding into electioneering. So I avoided it altogether. But the day after the election, <laughs> I was free at last. <laughs> and so I told my students, I, what I did though, was I made every one of them sit there and write down their response because we had been um, we had been in the building with big screens watching what happened and students had seen me walking around great big huge Obama shirt I had this sh shirt with the, the, his head was about this big and on, and, and on the back of the shirt was the yes we can speech written out in full and I walked around like this you know just um, <laughs> and so they had seen me in full Obama mama mode. But I had them all write down their response so everybody would have something to say and no one would be suppressed because I wanted to make sure, I had some conservative students who didn't vote for him and they wanted to talk about their reaction because they were moved. And so we talked about this and at the end of the discussion I said to them, you need to do this. If you have not read the Constitution, and I'm saying this to you also, if you have not read the Constitution, sit down and read it word for word. If you've read it before, read it again because we have a president who was a professor of constitutional law. And this is a, new, a unique opportunity. But if you read or reread the Constitution, look for the eight accommodations to slavery that were built into the Constitution. There are very few components of the Constitution that are unamendable. They made issues of slavery unamendable until 1808. So when Du Bois is talking about the emancipation of democracy, he's talking about the movement from the ideals of the founding fathers to the reality. And in doing what I told my students to do, I am, re I am actually reading a graphic adaptation of the Constitution. It turned out to be a really good book. And I did not realize that until the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were passed, that the Bill of Rights did not uniformly apply in all of the states. So when Du Bois is talking about the emancipation of democracy, he's talking about the struggles of African American people and their push for freedom having a benefit for the larger community. He then goes on to write another chapter called the reconstruction of freedom. What does he mean by that? He points to the role of black people during reconstruction when they could vote and when, especially when black men could vote and participate in the political system, the difference that they made in the South, the public school systems that they put in place in the South before they were pushed out of the political system and segregated in those institutions. He points out, and this chapter becomes the basis for his magnum opus this thick, Black Reconstruction in America, which I commend to you. He has three other chapters, the American Folk Song, Negro Art and Literature, and one he calls The Gift of the Spirit. But Du Bois had a chapter clumped with the emancipation of democracy, the reconstruction of freedom, called The Freedom of Womanhood. He felt that the contribution of African American women to the movement forward of of America, not just black Americans, because remember the subtitle, it's the Negro in the making of America. What have, have black folks done for the nation? And let me say this, it was published in 1924. It was part of a series of books that was aimed at stating the importance of the variety of ethnic groups already present in the United States to beat back the xenophobia, xenophobia that was leading to the restriction of immigration and the very rigid quotas that were adopted and stayed the law until 1965. What, but the freedom of womanhood had two major points that Du Bois made very well. One, 
well, the whole book made the point that every moment of black presence has been a benefit to America. But then in the chapter, The Freedom of Womanhood, Du Bois argues that black women liberated all women through their labor history, number one, and their political activism that led to community building, number two. Those were his two points. That there, the, gift of the, the gift of women exists. If Du Bois were standing here today, he would say the gift of women stands. Women who were builders, movers, and shakers, change agents. The gift of women stands throughout the odyssey from slavery to freedom. From the point of deportation, and I've been looking at women for a long time, and when we want to learn about women, we have to sometimes be conscientious about it because so much has been eliminated, elided. Sociology Dorothy Smith points out that because we focus on the relations of ruling, if we only look at visible leaders, we miss what's really going on. We miss what, what happens in everyday life that leads to and constitutes and makes our communities and societies. But I'm just gonna, to make my singular point, that this gift of an, Africa, of an activist womanhood accounts for the organizational integrity of every aspect of African American life that has challenged and changed America. I'm just going to take a brief walk and call some names and hopefully you'll be intrigued and want to know more about these folks and go out and learn some more. That's, that's what we do as teachers. We just want to get you all fired up so that you want to run to the library, run to the bookstore, run to nowadays Google, run, just run, run, run. How does the old spiritual go? Run, Mary, run. Why? Because you got a right to the tree of life. I learned something when I was at Yale a few years ago. I, I did a residency for a year at Yale, 1999-2000, and they have the Gilda Lerman Center there on slavery and abolition. I went to one of the lectures one day. A man was giving a paper on, on uh, they've done all this research, and I won't go into it because it, it, it's a lot of technicality, but just trust me on this one. Okay, we don't, we don't have time for all the technicality. But he'd done a paper where they had try to quantify the variables that most often led to revolts on slave ships. And he's giving the paper and he says, the variable that most often predicts rebellion on a slave ship is the presence of women. And you know, I'm sitting in the back of the room, I went, what? <laughs> Trotted up there. Not only did I get a paper copy of the paper, I got an electronic copy, so somewhere on my hard drive. And then he explained it because the Europeans were so, European patriarchy has some assumptions that African patriarchy does not have. And that was, a, it turned out to be a problem for the Europeans. They assumed that they didn't really want women because they assumed they, didn't work, they weren't as good workers. And the African slave dealers couldn't understand why they didn't want women because Africans knew, the various African peoples knew how hard women worked and how dependent they were on the labor of women. Indeed, um, check out the book Black Rice, because in the rice growing region of South Carolina, slave owners particularly demanded people from the Senegambia and they had to enslave both women and men because it was a gendered system of growing. So women, women have been very important to this. But what happened is these Europeans decided, oh, we don't have to worry about the women. They don't matter. We, we can just let them wander around loose so that they can be abused and raped and otherwise mistreated. And the women were no fools. They looked for where the weapons locker was. They watched what the shifts were on the watch. And they let the men know and helped them. And they found out, mm, by the end of the slave trade, women were on lockdown too. But, you know, it, you, sometimes we have to laugh to keep from crying, but think about it, the presumptions there. And when you, when you, if you've never seen Julie Dash's movie, um, Daughters of the Dust, you need to see it just to hear Nana Pazant say, her character Nana Pazant say, we are the children who chose to survive. And that choice for survival involved a lot, a lot, a lot, especially here in the, what is now the United States. During slavery, and let me just summarize this quickly, 
women made a tripartite contribution to the building of the internal resources that enable African Americans both to survive slavery and to approach the issue of freedom with a sense of hope that there may be a tomorrow and we're going to work toward that tomorrow. We, um, there's a wonderful book by Deborah Gray White called Aren't I a Woman that talks about female slaves in the antebellum South. And we already knew before we, I already knew and we already knew before we read um, Deborah Gray White's book that women made a tremendous contribution to the family. Why? Because it was women who did the child care. And during the last 40 years of slavery, when you have this massive population transfer of, um, of black people from the upper south to the lower south and west, it was often children who were sold off first. Um, a. Leon Higginbotham has this very poignant ad in his, his book about, um, ab about the law and slavery and, and the Constitution where there is an ad where a slave dealer is advertising a car full of slaves that consists of four and five year old little boys with no mothers. And to me, that, you, know, so when, you know, when do I stop reading and cry? It's something like that. Anybody who's ever taken care of little four and five year olds just can imagine the pain in that group of little boys. But we know not only are we talking about kinship, not only are we talking about um, fa fa family for your own children, but also the fictive kinship that emerged among women who took in children who were not their own and raised them anyhow. An ethic that still continues in what uh, Bob Hill talks about in terms of the informal adoption system, something that has been messed with by the state because of lack of understanding. So women contributed to building the enduring institution of the family, to use um, John Blassingame words. And also religion. When you look at the accounts of Hush Harbor religion, invisible religion in the slave South, women are there. When you read the slave narratives of men who write about growing up in slavery, their religious socialization is tied to hearing their mothers and their aunts praying for freedom, those clandestine prayers for freedom, prayers that slave owners were afraid of because they knew that their slaves were praying to the same God they were. And as Je Thomas Jefferson said, I tremble for my country when I think that God is just. But Deborah Gray White makes a good case for arguing that there's a third institution, a third set of resources within the slave community that she calls the Women's Network because women helped one another, and in the process of helping one another, they helped the entire community. In some ways, they retooled the toolkits that were, the cultural toolkits that they brought with them from Africa, their role as healers, their role a a as midwives, and they learned from the native peoples what the flora were that they should use for healing purposes. Um, I had my students read a book by Marcus Redeker last semester called The Slave Ship, and he talks about the whole institution. And the irony was that slave captains would dump crew members who were sick and ailing and just leave them on the beaches because they were trying to cut costs. Here are my children reading this book about what people would do to cut costs and make money at a time when our economy was collapsing. And you learn about how human beings will cut costs to make money. And who healed these, usually men, sailors left on the beaches? the people that they had enslaved, usually the women healers who knew what to do for their diseases when European doctors did not. But during slavery, everybody knows about Harriet Tubman, and we're taught in school that she is a conductor on the Underground Railroad. Well, I'm here to tell you tonight, Harriet Tubman was not a conductor on the Underground Railroad. She was an abductor on the Underground Railroad. Abductors on the Underground Railroad were to conductors what special forces are to infantry. People who went into the South and brought slaves out. She was the only woman and the only black who did it. All the other abductors were white males. Harriet Tubman, we can talk about Sojourner Truth and her travels around preaching against slavery. We know those women, but do you know Maria Stewart? who was the first woman 
in America to speak before a promiscuous audience. You are a promiscuous audience, men and women in the same room together, and leave us a manuscript as evidence. We don't know who the first woman was, but we know who the first woman was who left us a manuscript as evidence, and it was Maria Stewart. And the women who, black women who formed anti-slavery societies in the North, black women who participated in the formation of the African Methodist Episcopal Church in the North, Jerina Lee. Deborah Gray White points out that women in the slave community had their own special prayer services together and they generated their own leadership that sometimes became visible and provided leadership for the entire community. She talks about a slave named Cinda who had a vision and thought the world was going to end on a particular day which was not unusual in those days, because remember the Adventist movement was going full blown in the 19th century. The Sojourner Truth was part of that movement. And the entire slave plantation laid down their tools and stopped working and went on strike, waiting for that day. And the, the, owner, the owner beat them, tortured them, they would not go back to work until the day came and passed. So there's a tripartite contribution to the organized resources within. They are something within that enables survival, both physical survival and psychic survival. Du Bois tells us it's the voice of a woman who raises a song when they are told on the sea islands that they're going to lose their land. And then we get, let, let me call the name of Milla Granson, who, um, if, you, if you remember, it became illegal to teach slaves to read. But yet, a minimum of one in 20 could read in 1865 when emancipation happened. Those who could read would teach one. A woman by the name of Milla Granson ran a little school for slave children, black woman. She was a slave, she could read, and she would have 12 students at a time. You know, that number for discipleship. Thing. And when the 12 had learned, she'd let them go and bring in another 12. She got caught. And the state discovered they had said it was illegal for white people to teach slaves to read. They had forgotten to put in the law that it was illegal for slaves to teach <laughs> slaves to read. They had to go back and rewrite the law. So this is what women do, we, but we have to go back and look for them. Reconstruction, the educators arise. Women from the north, black and white, go south, and they discover, they, they want to bring the light of the gospel, discover that folks are self-catechizing community, been that way, Christian community, according to Rabateau, since 1820, but they want to learn to read. They want to learn to read that blessed book before we die. And they find themselves teaching children during the day and at night. Here come the adults, men and women, wanting to learn to read, bringing their produce as payment because they do not have cash. When we look at the women educators that go into the South and begin to build educational systems, build schools, then we can also say we need to look at the women who keep things moving yet with a steady beat. At the end of the Civil War, throughout the rise and fall of Jim Crow, they are women builders. They are the ones who start schools. Lucy Craft Laney, who was born a slave, builds up a school, an institute, and you know, the thing is, well, we, maybe we should only do industrial education in the South. There's a real ambivalence in America about educating people at public expense. And that ambivalence is rooted in this time period because people did not want to educate the children of slaves. They wanted them in the fields working, not in the classrooms learning. So there's been this struggle. And on the philanthropic side, it was, well, we'll pay for industrial education. Um, and Lucy Craft Laney said, okay, um, send me money for my industrial school. And in her industrial school, she taught French, she taught English, she taught Greek, all the liberal arts and all the good manners. She gave them the cultural capital and the social capital along with the educational capital. One of her teachers was Mary McLeod Bethune. You know that name. 
but she is identified by Sadie Iola Daniel as a woman builder. La Maggie Lena Walker, where people are forming burial societies at the end of the Civil War, ways to support one another, fraternal organizations. And Maggie Lena Walker takes the Order of St. Luke and turns it into a bank and becomes the first woman bank president of any color. There are so many more that I could name, if time would allow, but time will not. But let me mention, I've already mentioned um, Mary McLeod Bethune, but let me me mention someone who is also her, 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 her equal her, her, uh, her co in her cohort, a woman by the name of Nanny Helen Burroughs and another woman by the name of Charlotte Hawkins Brown. I grew up in a church that has a stained glass window donated by Charlotte Hawkins Brown, a young woman whose family had migrated from North Carolina and they were part of the founders of my church in 1878. 1878 in Cambridge, Massachusetts. They laid their cornerstone in 1883, the year my grandmother was born and Karl Marx, Marx died. And they decided they were going to build this church and they were not going to use the sanctuary until it was fully paid for. And, and, and that was the ethic of these folks, both from New England and from Nova Scotia and from North Carolina. And, 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 and Charlotte Hawkins Brown, took her education and went back to the South and built up the Palmer Institute. And, and again, providing resources, providing cultural capital for young people. Mary McLeod Bethune left um, Lucy Laney's school and went on to found her own school. You know the story, Daytona uh, Industrial and Normal School in Florida with a um, little bit of money on a garbage dump. and 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 took that vision. She went to a meeting of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs and sent a note up to Mary Church Terrell and said, can I say a few words about my school? And Mary Church Terrell said, yes, come here, young woman. She got up and spoke about her church and Mary Church Terrell was so excited. Now, for those of you who know the issues of conflict around color in, uh, in African-American life and culture, you need to see this scene. Mary McLeod Bethune came from a family in Maysville, South Carolina that was proud of their unbroken African heritage. And Mary Church Terrell occasionally could pass. And Mary Church Terrell, and she came from a wealthy family in Memphis, Tennessee. Her father paid for her to go to Oberlin where she chose to take the men's course so she could come back and lead and educate. I love Mary Church Terrell. She could go to Germany and give lectures in German. This woman was something else. And she is president of the National Association of Colored Women, which becomes the National Association of Colored Women's Club. She invites Mary McLeod Bethune to come up and speak. Mary McLeod Bethune speaks, and she jumps up, hugs her, and says, this young woman will be president of this organization one day. Mary McLeod Bethune beat Ida B. Wells Barnett in the election for the presidency in 1828. So these are the women who were busy building, and they were not only building their own organization, 1896, the formation of the National Association of Colored Women out of the merger of two women's organizations, the Colored Women's League headed by Mary Church Terrell, the National Federation of Afro-American Women headed by Margaret Murray Washington, the, 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 the pro Du Bois and the pro Booker Washington groups coming together and working through the, working through the conflict between these great leaders and building educational institutions that mirrored both philosophies and sidestepped the hostility that was going on between these leaders that um, Peter Paris calls leaders in conflict. Um, Mary McLeod Bethune built her school and, uh, and uh, Ida B. Wells Barnett heads the anti-lynching movement. She becomes the face, the voice the anti-lynching movement, which was largely a voice of advocacy around violence that was primarily aimed at black men. Not exclusively, there were women who were lynched. We don't hear about them because we have to go looking for the women. This is my point, go looking for the women. Go looking for the women. The book Gender Talk talks about those women who were also lynched. Sometimes they were lynched because they came out and tried to stop their husbands from being lynched. Sometimes they were lynched with their entire families. 
the history is so ugly. But here is Ida B. Wells Barnett, who's, who, who, who loses her parents in the yellow fever epidemic and um, wants to keep her family together, her brothers and sisters, who fibs about her age and gets a teaching job. And, but she's also writing editorials. She's also writing editorials. She becomes part owner of a newspaper and writes such a stinging editorial, such stinging editorials that her life is threatened. And here's this elegant woman walking around Memphis with a six gun on her hip, saying, I will give my life, I will sell my life dearly. You try to come and kill me, I'm gonna take you with me. We'll go see Jesus together, okay? <laughs> But eventually she writes an editorial that is so inflammatory that they burn her presses, burn down her newspaper office, and wait for her at the train station because they plan to lynch her publicly. And she is in New York on a speaking tour. And the activist women, the women in the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs, come together to help support her and relocate her and make anti-lynching part of their work. And I'm only at Reconstruction, and I could go on and call an awful lot of names, but we, but, but let's talk about this rise and fall of Jim Crow. There's a wonderful series I want to recommend. I mentioned it earlier today, but let me mention it again. NPR um, Public Television did it, and it's called The Rise and Fall of Jim Crow, and the producers consciously consciously identified both men and women leaders and talk about them together. They talk about the relationship between men and women dur during and after Reconstruction. The women who couldn't vote, who encouraged the men to vote, the women who provided security for the men's, for black men's political meetings, or who were present and participating in the discussion even though they could not vote. So when you go looking for the women, they are there. And you have, to, you have to seize that moment. And they build and they work. Anna Julia Cooper, who will be on the postage stamp this month, who, wrote, who told us that when and where I enter without suing, then the whole race enters with me. She grasped that, thing, that, that thought understanding, that idea that black women had. They said, yes, we are the most oppressed. But if we push from the bottom, the whole race the whole community will rise. And then we have to learn to go back and look at the civil rights movement with new eyes. I can call the names Septima Clark, Daisy Bates, Gloria Richardson, Joanne Gibson Robinson, and of course, Rosa Parks. But we also need to look at what people like Rosa Parks did after the civil rights movement, after the Montgomery bus boycott. She, we learned from that funeral of hers how much she had done to help build young people. She continued on in the tradition of a woman builder building up the young people and having them look forward to the future. When we turned on the funeral of Coretta Scott King, it was a learning experience to find out all the work she had been doing all of the time since Martin had left us. When, when, when you hear the head, former head of an FBI get up and say he gets a letter from Coretta Scott King and he is afraid to open it because he knows what the FBI did to them, and here is a letter inviting him to participate in a program that's aimed at quelling youth violence, and he goes. And so some may have complained that that funeral was too long, but for me it was one big ethnographic moment where I got to learn about the life of this woman and how much she had done. And she's paradigmatic, she's a model where women, African American women, when they need to address something, they will join organization after organization or start organization after organization. They have multiple memberships just for the benefit of lifting the community. They keep moving forward yet with a steady beat. If we look beyond the TV cameras, if we look beyond the voices that we, we're allowed to hear by the media, we see a tremendous contribution. Ella Baker, who was the first executive director of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, who goes on to facilitate the birthing of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, that gives us someone like Marion Wright Edelman, who after her work in SNCC, yet with a steady beat, gives us the Children's Defense Fund and has her motto 
ripped off by the Bush administration. No child left behind. She said, leave no child behind. It was trademarked. They knew it, but they said it anyway. But yet with a steady beat, she has continued with her work. And we have to look beyond 1965 and beware of the attempts to shame black people into a, into a, 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 a normative patriarchy that erases their appreciation of the power and competence of women and their leadership. Did you know that because of the Moynihan Report, Ebony Magazine was getting ready to publish a, a special issue on the contributions and the achievements of Negro women and when they, when they, saw, when they heard what the Moynihan report said they wrote an editorial saying all these achievements are wonderful but the past is behind us it's, it's time for women to go home and stand behind their man I have copies of that editorial but yet with a steady beat women kept on regardless I should call the name Fannie Lou Hamer while I'm standing here we've got to call the names and yet we can keep on going Angela Davis so many prominent women but we need to look at the stories of organizations read Paula Giddings' new biography of Ida B. Wells Barnett, A Sword Among Lions. Not only do you learn about Ida B. Wells, but it is like reading an ethnography of the organizational history of black America. It, you find out all the work so many people did to get us to this moment of celebration. And yet there's so many contemporary women who are still doing the work, yet with a steady beat. Yet with a steady beat. Cinda and Jarena Lee, Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, yet with a steady beat. Mary Church Terrell and Mary McLeod Bethune, yet with a steady beat. Ida B. Wells Barnett, Charlotte Hawkins Brown, yet with a steady beat. Dr. Mae Chin, yet with a steady beat. Mrs. Daisy Bates and Dr. Anna Arnold Hedgeman, yet with a steady beat. We can just keep on calling names. Thousands upon thousands of women and girls who who marched over bridges and into jailhouses and into freedom schools and in front of voting registrars. Yet with a steady beat, Fannie Lou Hamer and Septima Clark, yet with a steady beat, so many thousands more. The organizations and individuals who gathered money and talent and resources to change America and even before election night in 2008, America was because of these women. Dorothy Height. America was a changed place. In the 40 years since Martin Luther King stood in a Memphis pulpit and adopted the perspective of Moses, we've got some difficult days ahead, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will, and he's allowed me to go to the mountaintop, and I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. That promised land where, to which people were marching, yet with a steady beat. The majority of people today, and this is a good thing, but it's a problem. The majority of people today have no memory of Jim Crow. And we have to send our students now to the history books if they are to understand segregation in the United States, apartheid in South Africa, colonialism in Asia, Africa, the Americas, and the islands of the sea. We have to send students to the history books, but those history books have not included in an affirmative way the contributions of women. The odyssey that, that this nation has been through from slavery to freedom, it's not just a black odyssey, it's a national odyssey, has brought profound change. The Odyssey has brought also discovery of more and newer work to do. At this defining moment, at this instant of new possibilities where we can encourage new kinds of thinking and nurture great expectations, there are still tremendous places of great deep need where hope is still on board and where we need to make sure that that hope does not die before people can see the light. We cannot lose the beat. So much is still with us. Violence is still with us. Poverty is still with us. 
we need to look at poverty in our nation and in the globe around us. We need to look and see the clear link between AIDS and poverty and dislocation and challenge, that challenges all of us to address its causes and to seek its cures. Bauman Gillian, the founder, is a woman. In the face of this epidemic of greed and stubborn ignorance of the importance of community, we need to be reminded that the good and just society is neither the thesis of capitalism nor the antithesis of communism, but a socially conscious democracy which recon reconciles the truth of individualism and collectivism. We still need the leadership of women that lifts communities, that builds communities, that knits communities together and lifts up a nation. In the face of the resegregation of public education and the economic segregation of all education, we must still move yet with a steady beat. In this new defining moment, it behooves us to learn as much as possible about our potentials for new kinds of participation in government and governance. Look to the women, Charlotta Bass, who ran for president, uh, vice president a long time ago. Shirley Chisholm, who ran for president not too long ago. Carol Mosley Braun, who ran for president. And look at all of the women at local levels who have done the work, done the work that is necessary to push us ahead. We need to address all of these problems and conditions. We need to explore how women have done this and learn from them. Why? They have brought us to this place for which our fathers and mothers sighed, yet with a steady beat. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Jilks will take a few questions, but before the questions come, I would like to make this presentation. And of course, this is from the state of Michigan, and it's signed by John Powell, the state representative, Bob Byram, also state representative, Mark Meadows, state representative, and our very good friend, Gretchen Whitmer, state senator, and of course, our distinguished Governor Jennifer Granholm, and this is a special tribute to you. Thank you Dr. so Jennifer. much. Oh, she's been in the news lately. Yes. 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 So we'll take some questions. Stand up and shout your name out and shout your question out, please. Any questions? No questions. Any questions? Well, I always say to my students, it's thinking. clear as mud, right? <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Yes. Stand right up and shout. Uh, you, you'll be second. First. All right. I'm Dr. Karen Rogers. Back to you. Yeah. Um, I've been watching the Skip Day series on African American lives, and I'm wondering um, if you could tie that work, that large body of work that he's collaborating on, with some of the studies that you have participated in. Okay. Now, which series is this? Is this? Okay, people like Oprah and um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, Tina um, Turner, my girl. I love Tina Turner. Yeah, um, I don't know how that specifically ties in. Um, I think it's important in terms of confronting. Um, earlier when I was talking to a group of students, I talked about American um, racism uh, using the words of Jim Cohn as having sort of a try, uh, sort of like three legs to the stool, economic exploitation, political exclusion, and cultural humiliation. I think that that series combats the cultural humiliation, but it also helps us to begin to learn something about the diversity of the African American population. Um, both the diversity of our African background, which we, uh, and, and keep in mind, and, and, and I need to say this, it has only, um, John Blassingame's book, I think, came out in 1974, The Slave Community. Until the 1970s, 
And this, and th this is work that, it, 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 I, I get upset when, I still get upset when I realize this. Until the 1970s, the men and women who were enslaved in this nation were a variable in the debate between two schools of historians. One school of historians that said the South was right. And in that model, the Ulrich Bonnell Phillips model, people who were enslaved were too inferior to be on their own and slavery was seen as a civilizing influence. And that was it. Or there was the school that said the North was right. And that model, slavery was so destructive that it was impossible for people to be human. I remember getting, I, I mentioned the um, title of Blasting Game's book one time uh, to a colleague in the hallway. He was a philosopher, Quaker. He was also the director of African American Studies before I got tenure there. And this is a good man. This is, a, this is somebody whose heart, mind, and soul were in the right place. But when I said slave community, he said, it is not philosophically, and he meant this not philosophically possible for people who are not free to form community. And I'm like, if this is the presumption of American philosophy, this is the, this is the headwaters against, we're ro against which we are rowing. And so just to assert the humanity and the ability to respond in human ways to inhumane circumstances became a major issue. And so we did not have an understanding of the everyday lives of African Americans under slavery uh, and what people did for themselves. We had little stories, but interestingly enough, one of the biggest things to happen during slavery was the um, Nat Turner revolt. Where was it in our textbooks? Mm -hmm. Not, they didn't say how mumbling work. They just passed all these laws that said we had to have supervised worship and we couldn't be taught how to read because he was a literate slave preacher. So in that sense, series like that combat the cultural erasure. Martin Luther King in his last book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community. I also recommend that highly, highly, highly because he gives a laundry list of the um, issues that we must address. One of those issues that he cites in that book is the cultural erasure of African Americans as an, a component of American racism. He tells the story of he and his wife, and remember she was a professionally trained concert singer. Um, she knew the, the European body of work and she knew the spirituals. They go to their child's desegregated, integrated school to watch this pageant by the students on the, um, the peoples of America. They end after they sing all these songs from various ethnic groups, white ethnic groups, they end with Dixie. And he said he went home not only weeping for his children and the other children who were not not one single spiritual was shared with them. This body of work that Du Bois tells us is so important, and Du Bois is right about that. But he wept for America that did not know. So series like that does combat the cultural erasure, does help us to understand the diversity of the African American population's experience both during and after slavery, and the way in which various families, um, families and family histories were constructed. I'm not so sure, I, the ideology of DNA is problematic for me because um, I've got little students and I really, <laughs> they, have, they have to put up with my attitude because now the new thing is that when they walk up to um, a, an African-American student who's lighter than a number two brown bag, oh, are you biracial? <laughs> because if they're not quite fully black, then that's better. And so, they, and so, and the students have been writing on their civil discourse about, well, Obama's not really fully black. Well, um, hello? Yeah, um, you know, and so I make, in, when I teach my courses, I make, I, I, I let them know what the statutes were. Polly Murray, another name I should have called, put together at the behest of the women of the Methodist Church a book called States Laws on Race and Color. And you get this compendium of all of the laws that existed in the 48 states in 1950, including the legal definitions of who was 
colored. And in Alabama, now, you know, Louisiana was 164th. There was a limit. Um, <laughs> Alabama said not without limit or with reference to number of generations. And Kentucky, I mean, they just flat-footed said they, they, they were, they, the laws were aimed at the descendants of slaves. So, yes, we are a Creole people. Yes, we are a mixed people. But, and no, we did not make defined science out of defining who was black in America. But now, in terms of the desire to continue the exclusion of black people, now my white students want to measure how black people are not in the process of defining who they are. And so this is the new struggle that they face. You know, I, had, I, had, I, had a, I had a Latina student one time sit in a uh, meeting we were having um, on campus and said, I'm getting tired of being mistaken for a light-skinned black person. This is the, you know, racism is malleable and it changes. And I think in that sense, on the one hand, it does give us the diversity. On the other hand, it, it's feeding this other ideology that is, you know, how black are you really? You know, if you're not too black, I'll talk to you. One last question, all the way in the back. That oh, who was the out. second person? Oh, okay. okay. I just want to thank you for coming. I want to thank you for a wonderful presentation. And my question, in the new spirit of hope, mm -hmm. uh, what did you see our first lady, Michelle Obama, getting involved in, in terms of ah. supporting, <laughs> promoting, pushing black women, particularly, to uplift the race and to service our country? Did you see her speak in Howard? She's already started. Encouraging and uplifting a new generation of women who are trying to figure out how to handle their professional lives and their family lives, she is speaking out already. Did you see her talking to those school children who came in during Black History Month and telling them the history of, she's already started. Um, I love it, I love it, I love it. I, have to, I actually have to write a paper on this for the American Sociological Association this summer. So, uh, and I'm fascinated because what, during the campaign, she was compared to Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. And of course, they're talking about, well, Jacqueline Kennedy had, you know, original fashions from France, et cetera, et cetera. But, the, but what people don't talk about, and, you know, the importance of the first lady as an icon, and. It, when you go back into the history of black women, the refusal of people to call us ladies, to try to, you know, what, what the labels on the bathroom? White ladies, colored women. This is a new day just to call her lady. Okay. But when you compare what um, the way in which um, Jacqueline Kennedy became an icon and what is not talked about in terms of the things that she did. Did you all know that she, when she was running that school in the White House for her children, remember they were trying to keep James Meredith out of University of Mississippi. It took the confrontation of the military with governors to get one or two black students into universities. They were shooting at people. And didn't she have one black student? in that classroom. And nowadays we say one black student is tokenism. At that time, it was truly revolutionary. Okay. But remember in all of the tributes when she died, they didn't talk about that. Jet Magazine did. And if you, on, if you only read the um, magazines and newspapers of white America, you would have never known that Jacqueline Kennedy had that kind of relationship that she admired Martin Luther King, that she believed in civil rights. You never would have known any of that. You never saw any of the pictures of her visiting Coretta Scott King at the house after King was assassinated. And so, um, and a number of things that she did. So I, I'm actually gonna be working on this paper that sort of compares, you know, looks at how we construct American iconography in a racialized society. But she's already doing it, and, and, and the outreach, the kinds of things, bringing in people who are trying to learn how to be chefs who have been in jail. She's already had them in the White House. This woman hit the ground running. They both did. And it, it, it's just, you know, I, 
I, I, I just am amazed at, the, the other thing that I told my students was to go out and get books to learn about actually how the work of the presidency is done in everyday life, because we don't really know that. You know, and, and when Condoleezza Rice became Secretary of State, I read, sorry, reading, I still haven't finished it, but I've read enough of it. I read Madeleine Albright's book, uh, Madam Secretary, one, because Madeleine Albright was the first woman to become Secretary of State. But then I want to learn the work of Secretary of State. What is a typical day? What is the work? What must you do? What kinds of pressures are on you? And, and, I, and I had a different take on her than a lot of my colleagues did because I started finding out what was the work. So the, uh, Hillary Clinton did a wonderful book on doing things at the White House and w the kinds of things that have to be done there in terms of the choices and what it means to be in that fishbowl and to realize she has already started making, putting a signature on it, a stamp, and has opened it up to people who would never have had a chance to be in that White House in that capacity. And we're only at how many days into this presidency? So I'm real, and she, and, and she represents, and this is so important, before the women's movement started talking about dual career families, she represents that tradition that Barton Landry has identified that goes all the way back into the 19th century of educated black professional women choosing both marriage and family as well as career and being pilloried for it in the mid 1960s without an understanding. So, so she, 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 to me, she, she, does, she does a lot. Uh, obviously, now you're, uh, you're talking to an admirer. Hello? I am biased. I am a compromised personality. Oh, uh, there was a burning question here. Come on, stand up. And let's get that one, and then we're going to let her go. Go ahead. There you are. I meant to call you when I. Hi. 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 We know each other. <laughs> Briefly, <laughs> briefly. In terms of organization and kind of this behind the scenes. It's not just behind the scenes. We have to be careful about that phrase, behind the scenes. Because, and this is what happens when you look at the three square feet that represent the pulpit. Okay? Um, now, I'm not saying this to disrespect the pulpit. Hello? And then let me whip out my reverend doctor here just to make sure that you understand. Okay? But. This is what happens when we do the relations of ruling. Um, when you start looking at who built, and I, in some of the work that I do, I look at um, how certain denominations grew, where you talk about women who preach revival, women who dig out churches, women who form the missionary societies and control the money. And I think um, your professor, Dr. Waleen Dodson, has a book on AME church women that talks uh, precisely about this. So we need to um, be careful of that behind the scenes. When we talk about, for instance, the civil rights movement, one of the things that we miss, and I think it's key to understanding the gender roles of what comes to us visibly, the men who were largely preachers were employed by the black community. Their salaries were paid by the black community. The women, Joanne Gibson Robinson, the Women's Political Council in Montgomery, Alabama, who, Joanne Gibson Robinson, who went to Alabama State and ran off 40,000 leaflets on the mimeograph machine. And um, you have to, now it's, with this generation, you have to explain what a mimeograph machine <laughs> is and then have them picture these 40,000 leaflets as a Kinko's order all boxed up, okay? So that they understand what she did. These women were ready for a boycott, but they couldn't go before the cameras because most of the women leaders in the South at that time were educators. They worked for public education and they would lose their jobs. Septima Clark's um, sorority, Alpha Kappa Alpha, gave her a luncheon in her honor in, South, in, in Charleston. And when it came time for the group picture, they could not be photographed with her because they were all school teachers. And, you know, so what is, 
quote unquote, behind the scenes. Septima Clark was not behind the scenes. Ella Baker was not behind the scenes. Gwendolyn Zohara, now Zohara Simmons, was not behind the scenes. And um, I can't think of her name. I've got the reference in the book. She has written a book on women in the civil rights movement, sociologist, and she has these different categories of leaders. But um, the, well, one of the points that she makes is that some of the complaints about women's roles in the civil rights movement didn't really come from black women. They came from white women who were not allowed in SNCC to go out with men to go around um, canvassing door to door in black and white um, couples to um, canvass for voting. They were asked, and, and they felt they were put in stereotypical female roles because they were asked to run the office. They brought the skills with them. But I've talked to black women who were field organizers. Their parents did not, field secretaries, their parents did not want them to do that work. And Gwen Simmons has talked to, Gwen Zohara Simmons talked about the fact that she had said she was going to go to work for SNCC. They had a field secretary's job for her, which was usually done by men. Uh, her parents called the dean at Spelman. They locked her in her room till her parents could come to get her. Yeah, deans had that power. Remember when the age of majority was 21? <laughs> if you t your parents called the dean and said you couldn't change your major, you couldn't change your major. Okay? <laughs> I'm telling my age now. My father tried that. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> But she, they took her home, and she had to climb out a window and run away from home to be a field secretary for SNCC. Um, Gloria Richardson was not behind the scenes. Daisy Bates was not behind the scenes. And um, um, Melba, Melba Patillo Beals, I may have the, um, Warriors Don't Cry is the book. She talks about her grandmother, whose husband was a Pullman car porter, and he said, well, you're here by yourself. He taught her how to fire a rifle, and she was a crack shot who defended the house during the Little Rock um, campaign. So when you, you, that's why you have to just get the books and look for the women, but they are there. And I could go on. The women in the, um, Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham's book, Righteous Discontent, where you can see the women's struggle, a biblically-based battle over the issue of the pulpit. And when they lose, they say, okay, we may have lost, but we're not going to allow anybody who is inferior to us to minister to us. And they ratchet up the requirements for the ministry to a really high, high, high standard. So, you know, so I could, I could go on. If you look at the role of women in the sanctified church, I could go on. But they were there. But I, I just, we need to be careful about behind the scenes because the only reason these people are behind the scenes is because the writers and historians have not made the effort to say the women were there and to understand the importance of the work that gets done. When I interviewed Ann Tannehill, who was um, for a long time the secretary to the director of the Urban League, and when she retired, she was so indispensable to the organization. They had a mandatory retirement age, so she had to retire. And they then hired her back as an independent consultant. And I was interviewing her. She was 78 years old, and she was still an independent consultant helping to run the Urban League. And she told me, she said, well, the heads of the Urban League and the national office have been men. but." The local chapters are headed by women in addition to the Urban League guilds that raise the money for the Urban League. So here were women doing double duty, practical leadership in the local community and the additional of having these guilds that had all these great parties and soirees that raised all this money for the Urban League. A very successful organization and you need to sort of follow um, Vernon Jordan and his relationships to see how that influence is reflected in the Obama White House. Let us thank Dr. Jefferson. Thank you. And thank you. Every time you ask me a question, it helps me in the process of writing and doing research.
I thank you. Thank you. And Dorothy Height is a Delta. Yes.